Are you finished with it? Can we now? Okay, so we will start in any, in any case, uh, in the head of presentation, where will be a website address and this code that you can like enter. So, today we will speak about war in Ukraine, what, what is it, uh, what is the oranges uh, uh, reasons for starting this war, uh, with whom uh, fighting Ukraine in, rea in reality and what we can do with it, how we can help as a Greens, as a, as a young people. And um, Zhenya will help me. <coughs> oh, the sound is a bit bigger. <laughs> Um, I'm uh, for who for who don't know me. I am Katya. I am uh, from Ukraine originally, and uh, I'm a member of executive committee of CDN. This is Zhenya. It's our also Ukrainian activist and a former uh, CDN executive committee member too. And uh, Zhenya is uh, working in the sphere of also environment prote protection and climate okay. change. Yeah, my name is Zhenya Evgenia, as you like. Uh, I'm a head of climate department in Ukrainian civil society organization, the Correction. And here we have a third person from Ukraine too. Uh, I'm based now in uh, Ljubljana in Slovenia. And I moved like almost two months ago because of the war, but Katya and Zhenya, they in, in Ukraine. So they arrived here to this event uh, from Ukraine. So uh, I would speak probably from the perspective of, uh, yeah, of feelings and uh, what, uh, uh, yeah, how war touched us like during the the first months, like how it's affect me and my family, and Katya would like speak from uh, inside Ukraine and what's happening there and like what kind of situation, and we also like would go a little bit deeply to the history to understand why it's happening now and like what the reasons and uh, can we stop it and how we can help it. So, as uh, you already mentioned in the starting of our conference, that this war is not starting uh, 24th of February. This war is starting eight years ago, then Russia uh, occupied Crimea, then Russia started invasion on Donbass region and tried to occupy this, uh, not only this uh, region, but also Zaporizhia, Kherson, Mykolaiv, Odessa, so many uh, cities that they consider as Russian cities and like uh, uh, according to Russian propaganda, but of course it is not like this. But for today, it's uh, already 103 days of uh, Russian invasion. It's 103 days then from the time then uh, all Ukrainians wake up because of the news of <coughs> that uh, Russia started to bomb in our cities or uh, even early they, uh, they could wake up just because of the bombing near their house. Like as, as I wake up, then Russia started like my, my bed was shaken just. Like I wake up because of it. Uh, Zhenya uh, lived in Kiev, and uh, uh, she also wake up because of something happened. And Zhenya was in Kharkiv. Yeah, I uh, I just came uh, on 22nd February from abroad. Uh, on 23rd, I went to my family to visit them them for the weekend, and on 24th, everything began in Kharkiv too, like like in everywhere. So I just woke up at 5 a.m. from couldn't understand what's like happening, uh, like just noise or like you even can't understand what's happening because you never heard like the bombing. Uh, and 
I just started to open like all media resources, Facebook, and I just saw a lot of messages from my colleagues, from my friends on Facebook that people are hearing the same noise and nobody understands what's happening. And after like in the media, I started receiving a news that actually Putin began a full uh, scale invasion, the war in Ukraine, just like uh, at, uh, at 4.50 and at 5 they started bomb our city. And like in 20 minutes, we are like understand that we are in war now. And uh, I was in my hometown that is uh, near the Mariupol. And I think for now it's already everyone know where is Mariupol. And uh, in three days when the, this full invasion started, my hometown was occupied. And I, with my family, my friends, we spent more than one month uh, under Russian occupation before we evacuated ourselves. But still so many people stayed there because they don't have a possibility to leave. They don't have a place where to stay. And not every pe person uh, is ready to leave their home, to leave their life, and to migrate to someone else, to s somewhere in nowhere like of course uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, different ways to support ukrainian refugees but still you in you you cannot replace their home so how many i don't know how good a home that uh, someone can propose to ukrainian refugee can be but it never will ref replace the feelings of home and uh, feelings that you have a right on something you have a, a right to, to leave, actually. Um, what's going now? Also, we, um, it's uh, very hard to calculate how many people died. Like, we don't know how many uh, Ukrainian soldiers died, and we don't know how many civilians people died. And uh, civilians people, like, number of uh, deaths of civilians people is much, like, um, is much bigger than even soldiers because Russia bombing just the like cities, so Russia bombing civil buildings, Russia building schools and hospitals. Russia do not target only military uh, um, tar targets. Facilities. Yeah, um, but but still, uh, they firstly they started to target the only military facilities, but then uh, then they understood that they have a like uh, failure in these. So they started to bombing just just cities, and they justified okay, there is uh, um, there was a military base or something like this. Like we are not to, don't want to hurt civilians, but still they they did it. And a lot of people also died under like uh, buildings uh, which was destroyed, and uh, um, a lot of like and uh, even why we also cannot uh, calculate this uh, the total number because, for example, even in Mariupol, um, each city is under uh, Russian control now, and uh, we cannot calculate how many bodies they. Uh, were buried just in the parks, uh, just in the kindergartens, uh, gar and so on, uh, just because there is n there were no internet, there were no police, there were no uh, doctors to like, to classify what happened, and people just died, and then, uh, people the bodies of people just uh, stayed in the basement where people lived. And uh, even now, um, what Russia uh, does now in the occupied uh, territory, uh, they started to bury uh, these bodies to then um, to, to, to have no, uh, that international organization, for example, as a Red Cross or United Nations, how they cannot calculate how many <coughs> bodies there. They just burn it. Like they need the evidence uh, to prove that actually it's happened. So if there are no body, no evidence. Uh, they try to do the same, and uh, actually, when the war began, uh, we laugh uh, that uh, Russia brought with them like a mobile uh, burning machine, and we thought that they brought it for the Russian soldiers who is going to die in Ukraine. But after like. After we saw, after they left uh, Bucha and Erpin, and now the numbers like in, in, only in this uh, small uh, settlement city near the Kiev, it's not a big city. 
uh, there have been like uh, 20,000 uh, killed people who just like, um, uh, yeah, been like they didn't have any guns or nothing, so they just kill like people who just walk on the street, or uh, they came to the apartment to their homes and killed. And uh, after they or some numbers is burned, some number is buried like um, near the houses, or so sometimes they are still Ukrainian soldiers or who is working in that region. They find in a um, huge like, uh, graveyard with uh, thousand killed people like uh, in the cities. So we still don't know, even like in Bucha and in the Irpin, how many people died. Uh, there are some numbers that in Mariupol also around like 20,000 people killed. Uh, but actually the city is around 450 or something thousand population. Uh, half or something like that is left, but there is still like a lot of people. Some of them are, are moved uh, from uh, Mariupol to Russia without like even ask, uh, and we don't know the numbers like clearly how many actually died there. And uh, for example, for Mariupol, not every like uh, person died just because of Russian shooting. Uh, a lot of people died uh, because they don't have anything to eat and they don't have a food or they don't have any medicines and uh, just especially it's uh, uh, true about uh, retired people who st uh, had uh, like a, a bad health condition and they just died because any medical support there And uh, we already mentioned that Ukraine have a lot of refugees now. It's uh, not only refugee uh, who travel abroad now, but it also internally displaced people. Uh, a lot of Western uh, cities, big Western uh, cities on the west of Ukraine, they accepted now the, the huge, huge amount of refugees. And now I am also an internal displaced person because I now with my family I live in Lviv, that is closer to Pol Polish border. And but my other part of my family stayed in Berdansk still because they don't want to evacuate. There are some refugees who is coming back to Ukraine because it's uh, they can't afford to stay abroad in Europe because it's uh, it's uh, expensive for us to like live abroad, if, especially if you don't have a job and so on. Mostly, it's uh, who left. It's a woman with children. Sometimes it's not only one children. Sometimes it's two and three, uh, and uh, they should like. Uh, go through all these document procedures and so on, and plus they care about children, so it's uh, people are tired, they want to just come back home and so on, and uh, there's even like people who started to come back to Kharkiv, it's like to my hometown, so um, uh, during the first like two months, there's around 75% who left from the city, and now people started to come back, like even though there's still like Russians uh, close to the city and uh, there's still bombing happening, uh, people started to come back, and some of my relatives already back, and my family actually also thinking about that, which is I'm not uh, happy, uh, but it's hard to convince and uh, the old generation people, it's uh, very hard to actually explain that uh, you can't protect this house if like uh, against the bombing or uh, people with a gun. So at least you could be alive, but unfortunately that's what, like it's one of the problem that uh, what we also seen that it's hard to convince people even like to leave their house, even though like you can't do anything in this situation. Uh, yeah, and uh, not everyone can return to their home. So people who are left uh, occupied territory, they then they then then have a place to return, like because if you return, you you will live under Russian occupation, and live under Russian occupation, it's like, it's very hard now. And uh, also, one like important notice uh, that uh, um, as uh, all already Jenya said that uh, most of our refugees is a woman and a children uh, because uh, men it's, uh, cannot leave the country like only if you have some special condition for example more than three children or some health uh, disabilities so yeah mostly it's just a woman and they're uh, like the one of the most vulnerable groups now
and uh, also so many people like to say that it is uh, Putin's war, but for today we have uh, more than um, 2,000, 1,000 uh, died Russian soldiers, so it's, it's not just Putin's war. It's, it's war of soldiers who died. At, uh, it's a war of soldiers who are now alive and uh, and uh, are in Ukrainian territory trying to fight. It's uh, also war of their families. It's a war of their friends who support their decision at, and people who just stay in calm and in silence during this period. Yeah, and here you can uh, vote uh, on your phones. You have uh, uh, several options, and you can answer it. how. How do you think uh, why uh, this war happened? There is a quote number. If you didn't access the menu before, so there is a quote, so you can use it. And after you will see the questionnaire. So yeah, we just want to understand like what kind of thoughts, and we'll keep continue and actually if you have uh, any questions or uh, you need a clarification or something during when we speak uh, so just raise a hand and we can stop and talk a bit more on question that you're interested in. So as you see, we have a bit of a problem with the Wi-Fi. So um, there is a um, hotspot on now, um, Office. It's called Office. And the password is from 1 to 8. Very creative, I know. Someone still need some time maybe to answer? Actually, all this uh, proposition that have we didn't come up. This uh, it's uh, sometimes what Russia communicated. So if some of them are looks for you, like uh, I don't know, um, bullshit. So I can't find any other words for this. Uh, so it's what Russia is communicating, like why they begin, and uh, what's also important that every time they communicate a new reason to begin a war. So. Every day somebody is speaking and every day they have different reasons why it's happening. Yeah, then uh, Putin announced this, uh, uh, as they call it, special military operation. Um, they said that uh, they need to denazify Ukraine, they need to delimitarize us, that uh, they are like uh, treating uh, them as uh, because we want to join NATO and NATO, at, like it's uh, NATO is uh, now attacking uh, Ukraine and oh, Russia and so on. So many like bullshit, but like one of the, my favorite one, it's my, our bio laboratories, bio labs, mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, Ukraine prepare some like um, birds, ducks who can also attack. 
brush <laughs> by my air <laughs> and spread some, uh, for example, coronavirus. <laughs> this these ducks, but they actually said it on their pro pro national TV, and uh, people still like uh, use uh, these narratives and their communication. And uh, one of the the most common, I think, this uh, Ukraine kills civilians in Donbass. They usually like then you trying to speak to someone from Russia who support all this shit. They uh, said, okay, but Ukraine uh, bombed uh, Donbass region for eight years, and uh, Ukraine like no one care, and uh, now like you started to care about uh, war in Ukraine, this full scale invasion, but actually like. Ukraine <laughs> did not uh, like uh, do it, and uh, they usually use it uh, like as a propaganda narrative. Why, uh, why they justify this killing? Just because okay, like we are uh, suffering for eight years, so why you cannot suffer for one month, for example? And it's what uh, Russian soldiers uh, told me in the Russian block was so when I tried to leave uh, from my hometown to control by Ukraine territory. Okay, but I choose that uh, this uh, audience is not uh, use propaganda, Russian propaganda narratives, and it is good. <laughs> so, and <laughs> now we will go uh, more deep, uh, deep in history and why like uh, the war this war happens. Um, here is you see a photos uh, from. Um, um, eight uh, uh, May uh, night a uh, night May parades and night May preparation is a, a day of uh, victory and uh, like Nazis Germany uh, Second World War and uh, they usually celebrated all these uh, like years they prepared their population to to some to some war. They prepared uh, pop uh, their population to be more tolerant uh, to killings, to more tolerant to the deaths, and uh, they like uh, remember the population that there uh, were Nazis, and now Ukraine is Nazis, and we should fight fascism, we should fight Nazism, and uh, yeah, they even dressed uh, children and the children in kindergarten as a like soldier, as a nurses, and uh, they they spread also these uh, kind of emotions and through all people. Like you can see that the propaganda started from the kindergarten, so people like from the childhood they like uh, inside the system. So it's hard after to fight, even though there's of course some people who can like, um, have a, crit a critical mind. So they I don't know using different resources, reading like. I don't know, some independent media, pr not Russian, but uh, at least like uh, they know so, like English or some any languages. Uh, but when you're like, uh, I don't know what's going to be with these children, because um, me now as Ukrainians look like the propaganda is now getting harder inside Russia. So I'm afraid like what's going to be in the future when these children is like will grow up. Uh, yeah, what the next would be, okay, Putin would not survive probably until that moment, but probably from these children could also be like raised uh, another Put Putin's or like s copy of him who would like continue uh, the same uh, uh, path uh, as Putin actually begins. And usually they uh, did uh, the same on occupied territory. So in the Crimea and in Donbass, they raise uh, children in uh, the same way. And uh, now, like uh, this uh, Donbass uh, children, like uh, Donbass occupied territory, this part, uh, they also thought that uh, like uh, Ukrainian are Nazis and they were trying to kill them. Were very like we hate uh, Russian language, we hate everything Russian, but like. Um, as uh, this popular phrase, uh, phrase that uh, no one co contributes so much to Russophobic so uh, like um, um, like to Russophobia years, uh, emotions as uh, as much as that Putin did it like we, we now is very triggered by uh, every Russian like 
like not Russians, but um, every Russian narrative appear around us. And but what <laughs> we have a very, very long history of relationships, uh, very complicated uh, relationship with Russia, like Ukraine, Russia. Of course, it's not always was a Russian Federation, but it was Russian Imperi uh, Empire. It also was a, a period of uh, occupation of uh, under Sov Soviet Union. And uh, like usually what like did, uh, what was from Russian side, they tried to oppress Ukrainian language because they saw uh, they they were very afraid when Ukrainian use Ukrainian language because it is part of our identity and uh, the huge huge part of Russian propaganda now and uh, like at that times too concentrate around Ukrainian language and uh, they said that it is the same as Russian for example but it is not even Ukrainian language have more in common even with Polish than with Russian like we have more in common this Belarus language but not Russian and they uh, banned uh, the po any possibilities to use Ukrainian language they burned Ukrainian books uh, they banned to study in uh, like in Ukrainian in Ukrainian in schools they like, they just tried to stop everything everything that it is in Ukraine. And uh, consequences of it is also is destruction of Ukraine culture. They try to rebuild it somehow to make it more Russia style like. They try uh, they try to like stall our artists and call them Russian artists and even they if they uh, said that we are Ukrainians but Russia still like said oh it is our they also banned any like possibility, for example, to have a Ukrainian theater, to have a Ukrainian literature. So it uh, was very hard, and uh, usually people who Ukrainian artists uh, who um, identify themselves as Ukrainian and uh, this, uh, these people who want to like uh, work in Ukrainian, uh, they usually was tortured, they usually was uh, captured, they even was killed, so we have uh, several times, several periods, then uh, they, um, there were huge murders of Ukrainian artists. They just kill, they could kill for, for, for example, 15, 14 people for a day. They just uh, came to their buildings, they came to their house, they kidnapped people and they, they were tortured and killed. Just I want to clarify that uh, that what Katya uh, said it's happened in twenty century, so uh, all that uh, didn't happen even like eight years ago. So all this uh, trying to change Ukraine, trying to influence was like much more earlier before, and uh, it's continue now. Um, and what they do. Like the next point, what Russian do, and it is changing Ukrainian history. Like they usually like to say that Ukraine never exists and Ukraine have no reason to exist, and uh, uh, they said, okay, like if there is. Um, oh, it will be a spoiler. <laughs> I will skip this part. Uh, so they um, usually try to rewrite somehow history to make more accent of, on Russian domination that we did not have uh, uh, never our governments when you never um, when never had uh, like any um, right to self identifying and uh, they said that uh, Russia helped us to do everything and that's all that they are like our big brothers or even our father or mother who help us to go and uh, yeah. and uh, suppression of Ukrainian identity uh, there are so many cases uh, that for example you should write in passport that you are Russian like not Ukrainian or not Georgian or not Belarus people just to be safe like uh, because uh, like if you're Ukrainian you should they you you are suspicion or maybe you're like a spy or maybe you're um, like uh, you're Nazis as they usually like say it 
and uh, people just to hide that their Ukrainian people uh, do, uh, do not want to, did not want to, to, to speak Ukrainian, for example, because they show that they are against the regime. They also co could be like captured by uh, their, usually it was by Soviet government, like because we have more um, proofs uh, for it from the Soviet times. For sure, but uh, um, yeah, for, uh, artists uh, started to write something in Ukrainian to uh, identify f uh, Ukrainian Russian, and yeah, so it, it's very, very long history, and it's very um, like hard e even for now to understand how how big damage Russia did to us because like uh, it is not uh, the. Uh, real death, for example, it's just uh, missed uh, missed possibilities. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the most painful like um, periods, it was uh, of periods of genocide, and uh, it was uh, mostly did uh, also by Soviet Union and they have uh, three like uh, big uh, genocide periods and you can see how many people died there. They just died because of their lack of food and uh, sometime in some periods there were really not so much food because of the wars but uh, especially in the, the second one it was uh, fully artificial uh, holodomor just uh, uh, russian soldiers soviet soldiers they just uh, came to the houses it usually was in villages like uh, city people and cities uh, did not suffer so much how people in villages uh, like soldiers just came there and take away all food that people had. They even like take away uh, animals like uh, to from which uh, people can get some milk, for example, or eggs. They like just took away like, everything and they said, okay, we have a like um, agriculture crisis. We don't have food. We have don't have uh, any grains. But uh, uh, as uh, we see evidence that. Uh, now, in that time, in this year, Soviet Union be, was uh, the biggest expert, uh, one of the biggest exporters of grains and uh, wheat. They just take, uh, they did from like, and uh, they did it for special to also to raise down all Ukrainian identity and uh, to like make people afraid uh, to be like to feel there as a Ukrainian because it can be it can repeat. And also we had. Um, a few um, ways of uh, deportation. There's uh, also like mostly people from villages. Usually they uh, were like deported to um, like uh, to the east uh, eastern part of Russia, to like uh, to Sakhalin, to Nov Sibir, and so on. So my, a lot of Ukrainians uh, were lived there. They even had uh, the the big Ukrainian cities, the uh, big Ukrainian districts, and uh, for example, Zelenik Klin. It's, it's one of the most uh, famous there are people speaking uh, um, Ukrainian there, and they have uh, even their Ukrainian governments of some time. But of course, it was um, oppressed uh, them by Soviet Union too. And uh, you can see a photo from like, uh, from uh, one of the mm, this uh, whole more periods when people just die and uh, like even kids and uh, people started even to eat e each other and it's what you can imagine how like uh, hard it was. And yeah, you can vote here too. <laughs> how uh, how you should. Uh, call like this period of uh, also uh, pre-Ukrainian government. <laughs> so you should choose uh, the right uh, name of the state.
actually what uh, also Russia started um, after uh, occupy, uh, Donbass occupation, they started to call uh, Kievan Rus as the uh, ancient Rus, uh, just to avoid mention that uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Kiev was founded earlier than uh, was, uh, yeah, than Russia. I can show you the slide. We have also it's very old, old meme <laughs> that they had. Uh, and uh, they renamed uh, articles on Wikipedia. They uh, rewrite their books of history to like uh, to um, to replace key one Rus with ancient Rus. It's just one of the uh, examples how it works. It's one of the like uh, famous examples of how Russia rewrite history. But uh, during all this time, we had a big big protest. Uh, um, movements, and yeah, we never stop fighting. Like uh, a lot of, even then, so many people were tortured, so many people were uh, killed, but they're still fighting, and that's why now we have our government. But now we have an independence. But we have so many, so many examples. So I will not uh, like stay here on this slide because it can be for a whole day. <laughs> And uh, it uh, will be very fair to mention uh, Crimean Tatars, especially like as uh, Russia occupied the firstly they occupied Crimea and uh, um, Crimea. It's uh, like a motherland of Crimea Tatars, and um, they also they like oppressed so many times. But uh, by Russian Empire, by Soviet Union, they were deported so many times. And the the, the huge uh, deportation was uh, in uh, 1944. You maybe even heard some uh, Jamala, uh, our singer Jamala. He had uh, uh, she won the Eurovision with a song about uh, she's a Crimean Tatar uh, origin, and uh, she. And so I like, could try to tell to European community about such a tra tragedy. And um, it was, uh, it caused also as a genocide because uh, a lot of people died in the, their road to this eastern part of Russia. And uh, even like uh, for some calculations, mostly um, half of the people who were deported, they died uh, because of the hungry. I have some more comment. It, uh, um, Ukraine now is very supportive to Ukrainian Tatars, and um, then um, like, uh, and uh, they had their autonomy, cultural autonomy, and now in Ukraine they have uh, like uh, fully support from the gov uh, from the government to Ukra Crimean Tatar language, Crimean Tatar culture. They have their own TV channel. They have so much books translated to this language. And uh, like, well, <laughs> we are not Nazis, <laughs> as uh, Russian said. We we try to help uh, uh, other like, uh, folks that live uh, also uh, with us. We are, have very good, friendly relationships with them. And uh, for example, Crimea Tatars, they were the first uh, like. Uh, ones who uh, went to a protest, then Russia started occupation of Crimea. So even it it was not even like uh, uh, Ukrainians who speak Ukrainian. It was Crimea Tatars. And uh, to this day, even someone like was uh, murdered. And now we are moving to the like more modern history, uh, and we will talk about revolution of dignity. And you can also vote <laughs> why why people started this revolution, why we start, started to protest.
So free uh, all these uh, um, options, uh, also from uh, Russian propaganda. So usually, uh, maybe you also like uh, meet the already know about it, that they like to say that it's all Soros, or Soros money, or it was funded by European Union, or it was uh, fu funded by uh, United States, uh, and so on, and they just pay money for to us to go to a protest. And um, I actually, <laughs> about uh, this, during the Revolution of Dignity, I was in Crimea, so I, like I internally deplaced de person for the second time because of Russia. So firstly, I should move for, from my university where I studied in Simferopol in Crimea. I moved to, to Kiev and then like I don't have a home, my whole town because of Russia again. Uh, so yeah, they usually like to, sp uh, to say that it is source. They like to say, that, okay, if you have some like, politician, for example, Poroshenko, who became our president after that, that they just paid us and so on, but uh, not so actually people like uh, uh, to see any party uh, symbolic of this protest. And um, also, they like to say, oh, it's just like drug addicts, people or homeless who don't have a place uh, to go, and they uh, stayed uh, on this uh, like, uh, Maidan and, and in this main square because there are food and uh, some like support from volunteers. That. And but actually, like uh, the. Uh, the uh, the last two options is like more right, um, as we will explain after that. So, uh, what happened? Like our president Yanukovych, who started uh, to create it, like to establish it there, uh, his uh, dictatorship regime. Um, uh, he will was supposed to sign this agreement of associations with the European Union, but in the last moment he refused. And uh, then uh, one of the, our journalists, uh, he wrote in, I think in Twitter even, uh, let's uh, like drink coffee on the main square, and people went out, they started to protest it, just it was a peaceful protest, like no one attacked anyone, uh, it was like usual protest, but uh, then, um, they started to use uh, like uh, this Yanukovych forces and uh, all these structures, uh, corrupted and pro-dictatorship, pro-Russian structure. They started to, to attack people, but uh, mostly it was students. They started to attack students. And then even who um, like was not care about uh, association of uh, this European Union, about this agreement, they started, uh, they also went out to the streets to help these people who were attacked. So mostly it even was like um, the trigger for such big uh, protests were uh, response to violence, from violence from the state. But uh, then like uh, people use uh, uh, the, already forgot <laughs> words in, in English. They use uh, their fight for European uh, values, where they used to fry, uh, fight for democracy, uh, for their freedom, for their freedom to choose to, to not to be oppressed by police, or no, do not to be oppressed by uh, army, who can just uh, kill uh, the civilians who want to like, protest. And uh, during this, uh, protest, like it was not that easy. It was very painful. It wasn't uh, like for one day revolution and everything changed and everything became very, very good. Like it was a few months of fighting. It was a few months of fighting with police who had guns. And uh, like more than 100 people died there. They just were like um, shot by uh, Ukrainian police. But uh, then, um, uh, Yanukovych, um, he left the country to um, Russia <laughs> and started to give some press conferences uh, from uh, this country and say, oh, I am a, uh, like a legitimate president, and, but for people not like, and we, then we started uh, 
but no, then started occupation of Crimea, then started uh, occupation of uh, Don part of Donbas region, just because Putin felt that, okay, uh, in this moment Ukraine is weak, and this moment uh, we can like act something. And we had a very weak army for this time, because no one prepared to war. And uh, even this like pro-Russian government prepared every, uh, like, uh, they prepared somehow to attack uh, from the west side, but not from the Russia side, and uh, like our borders was uh, unsecured. This. Actually, during the last years uh, before the Maidan, um, you probably know Yulia Tymoshenko, the only woman, uh, the policymaker in Ukraine, famous. Uh, she was uh, she's leading the reform to uh, stop any military in Ukraine, like to cancel any army in Ukraine. So I don't know, is there been a like, connection with Russia and uh, maybe that was the common plan to actually in, in, in the end, like, so they would just take, uh, like at some moment, uh, come and uh, take Ukraine because like we can't protect ourselves, we would not have any army, we would not have any um, like people who would be prepared for that. Uh, so like during the last years before the Maidan, so the army of, like almost died in Ukraine. And during the, like after the Maidan, after occupation of Donbass, there's a lot of uh, men, um, women who went to, to the East and actually like, at some moment we've been prepared uh, until this war because of the Donbass and the because a lot of military went uh, through all that um, horrifying actions like in East of Ukraine during uh, last last 80 year, years. Like you can see on the photo how many people participated in this protest, is how many people participated in revolution. And uh, these uh, like protests were not only in Kyiv, they were on uh, all uh, centers. Even in Crimea, I attended, in Sephiropoli, I attended uh, like, uh, this Euro Maidan protest uh, until it became very dangerous. So people, people fight a lot and uh, like people wanted to achieve something and they sacrificed so many times in this their lives to receive some freedom. And also in the European Union and during this time started some protests to support Ukraine. And how this Crimean uh, and Donbass occupation started, so uh, <coughs> Russia um, mobilized their forces and um, they had, for example, in Crimea parliament, uh, Crimea had uh, their own parliament, uh, they mobilized a pro-Russian party, like Russian unity, for example, they had such party, and they uh, promoted Russian uh, way of you know, development. Uh, they promote pro-Russian cooperation, uh, cooperation with Russia all these years, and now they just like uh, click on on something, and uh, um, so many people went to like uh, to the street to support Russia, but they like on the, but yeah, people uh, also were brainwashed there so much, but of course not everyone supported, and so many people did not support, but it was very dangerous to them also to say it about this, because so many uh, uh, activists were kidnapped, and um, a lot of uh, went to control by uh, Ukraine territory, and, and um, then they started to make this referendum to say, okay, it's all legal, people just want to be, to be a part of Russia. But like, of course, this referendum uh, was not legal according to Ukrainian governments, but even like not co counting these, uh, there were only uh, f like, uh, two options on this when uh, people voted. Um, Crimea should be part of Russia, and Crimea should be independent. But then Crimea like became independent. Somehow they will just uh, decide to join Russia, and so. But there were no option. Uh, Crimea stayed as it as it was, and it was very manipulative. Uh, manip 
cooperative referendum and they did it in the same scenario as they uh, did in Tran Transnistria and uh, occupied Georgian part. And uh, even the numbers of like results of the election <laughs> was uh, completely the same, like 97, 98 percent. And like as uh, I am as a witnesses of all of this, they just like anyone could uh, came to this um, like places and to vote. They even did not check any passports. So are you Ukrainian? I not. What? Who are you? Like so many random people voted just to create this picture of, of democracy or something democratic democratic election but like I, I'm like I'm not sure if uh, even someone counted the votes there and then um, like uh, during this occup Crimea occupation, so many protests, pro-Russian protests started on other cities in uh, in Ukraine. The, one of the biggest was in Donbass and Lugansk, the city that was occupied then. Even in my hometown, they had such protests, but like uh, it, it finished very, very quickly. And then so many pro-Ukrainian people also went there and stopped all this. But yeah, it, it was, and it was um, like so many evidence that it was sponsored by Russia. Actually, like even in parallel with the Maidan, uh, like uh, Yanukovych or after Yanukovych has left, there has been like a lot of evidence that uh, uh, people who work with the government or who are receiving the money from the state, it's like teachers or who's worked at, um, I don't know, industry, but it's like um, Ukrainian industry, so they, uh, put people in the buses and brought to the key of to see that there is opposition to the Maidan, so there is people who want to be a part of the Russia or something like that. So it was like always, but uh, if Maidan is, was fully independent and nobody financed and people like just bringing food, uh, I don't know, uh, hel help try to help people like all around, host people who like came from, I don't know, west or from different region to, to the Maidan, so uh, the people who like brought in this pro-Russian uh, pro agenda, so usually, or they've been paid, or they work for the state, so they just like didn't have the chance to make a decision. They just like been forced to to do that. And. Then uh, the war started in Donbas region. Then uh, Russian, like it was uh, they, in, it wasn't directly Russian forces. They uh, just uh, pretended it was uh, some um, soldiers uh, from Donbas, like uh, people who live there. And but uh, still, so many evidence that Russia supplied weapons, so Russia supplied some of these. Um, military cars and so on to this region and to help like and also provide so many soldiers to to fight there and uh, as we also said that our army was very very weak so the next step what what happened it was ceasefire and uh, and um, in such case uh, um, in such way this uh, conflict was frozen and um, it was frozen for these eight years. But still, during the ceasefire, uh, Russian side so many times violated uh, these agreements. They so many times fired. We st still had uh, such uh, uh, very, very crucial cases of violations of any like uh, humanity values. And uh, um, they just uh, like uh, killed people. They just killed our soldiers. They kidnap our soldiers. They torture torture them. They kidnap a lot of journalists who went there to like uh, to have uh, like evidence what happened, and um, yeah, it, it uh, so many human rights were violated uh, during this like uh, confrontation site and also on occupied territory. Now you can wait here too. Yeah. Did you believe that Russia would start a full-scale invasion of Ukraine? Yes, no, abstain. Yeah, from what you heard like before.
so no one will like except two people <laughs> who voted no one uh, was prepared to such uh, crucial invasion like even i did not believe for the last time that it could happen in the like uh, 21st century Okay, in my organization, okay, action, we uh, discussed actually the possibility of the war, war would begin, like what we are going to do. And we had like a plan, uh, so everybody would go to the West, Ukraine, uh, and like uh, move from Kiev, where it's like uh, our office is based and like people live uh, from the office. Uh, we like try to collect some money to have like cash because probably like the banks would be uh, like, um, but uh, even though like we discussed it, but we are uh, always say okay but it's not going to be happen it's never going to be happen it's not true like but uh, it, it's a little bit like help us uh, that we've been a little bit probably emotional prepared that uh, when it's really happened and we had some like ca cash money or uh, we had like a plan but uh, when we plan to go to the west and when uh, on 24th everything begin and we understood that actually everything is bombed and you can't go to the west because west is also bombing and there is like no safe place where you can go and feel safe uh, because they come like from the from Belarus side from Russia side and like from the sea side they're bombing uh, like other regions so there is no like safe place for us where like we can go and yeah, like be safe at that time uh, when we discuss I thought that uh, okay but I would go to the Kharkiv even though it's like uh, close to the Russia because all my family there and I was like 100 sure that they would not leave um, the city without me uh, so uh, at some moment uh, I, w I was lucky that uh, at the beginning I've been at home and like we've been all together and we uh, like figure out how to move from there all together because I even not imagine how what would go to the home uh, like when all trains from the east going like west uh, like everybody's trying to leave for the trains is full of people people like standing for 20 hours in the train from Kharkiv to Lviv there is like even no place to sit or sleep. Uh, they just stand because like everybody is afraid and everybody just want to leave their homes, their hometown to be safe. And uh, when I was in Berdyansk and uh, it, uh, every, everything started, uh, we uh, did not have any possibility to move. Like it's very, it was still, uh, was very dangerous to, to go even by car. Uh, we had only one train and it was stuck uh, in the nearest city of uh, Berdyansk, so no way like by train. And uh, all roads uh, from uh, Berdyansk to Zaporizhia, the closest uh, administrative center, uh, all roads, uh, roads were under shelling. So like uh, cars, uh, the whole cars is uh, like, uh, the cars with whole families was uh, like uh, just uh, uh, bombed, uh, they just like shooting on them and uh, the whole families could die uh, then on the, their way to, to evacuation. And that's why we decided to stay in Berdyansk because like we were was very afraid to go like uh, to, to, to evacuate because of such road. And uh, how like uh, the, the days before the invasion started, like firstly, um, these leaders of um, Donbass occupied uh, uh, quasi state uh, they started to evacuate uh, they started the evacuation of the women and children to uh, Russia of course and then um, like Putin um, uh, signed there um, that um, they recognized the uh, independence of, of these quasi states then um, like Russian Duma agreed like that it is okay to use uh, their military on the territory of uh, other independent states that they recognize as uh, based on bus uh, quasi states before and uh, like uh, early morning 24 February it's all started
So, and how people in Ukraine reacted on this? I think you all like also notice how how big now is uh, how active uh, now are our civil society like representatives and people try to help in any any levels like so many people volunteer to go to the army uh, not uh, not only men only a lot of women like uh, around thirty percent of Ukrainian army is a woman like we are not like not only like some guys fighting there. And uh, so many people became a volunteer. Uh, they volunteer the humanitarian support. They volunteer to army. They volunteer in informational field. Like uh, in any field, you need help. Like in any field, uh, people mobilize. I can see on the picture that uh, all the woman who's uh, baked the bread for the soldier. The old man was a small child. Uh, they moved from east, uh, and only he has a driver license. And the whole family, like his son, uh, his um, daughter-in-law, uh, and uh, how it's uh, like uh, the children. So he, he drived for I don't know more than fifteen hours, if I'm right, to Lviv. I uh, like to take them to the safe space uh, to the West Ukraine, but he's like, I don't know, more than 75 and he managed to, like, they had a, an old car, but they managed to get to the West and uh, get a lot of support. Uh, there is like a lot of firemen uh, who like, I don't know, did so much uh, work, like because a lot of Ukrainian city just like been destroyed and still even though like a lot of people lived in this, in these houses, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, like they're trying to at least like uh, save these people. Uh, there's like probably, you know, about Mariupol who's like totally destroyed. There is actually not only Mariupol is destroyed. There is a lot, a lot more similar cities in, in Kharkiv, like the whole, uh, because Kharkiv is the biggest city, or second biggest city in Ukraine. It's like 1.5 million. Uh, so you can imagine like 75% of uh, 1.5 million are moving like from the city, how it's look like. Uh, and uh, like uh, one of the part of the city is the same as Mariupol, totally destroyed. Some uh, part are like, m like a little bit destroyed, but still like the bombing and the war is continuing there. So we don't know when it's going to stop and uh, in what condition. There is also a woman who has been a playboy model and he's uh, cleaning a potato in some uh, cafeteria in Kiev, also cooking for the territorial defense. And there's like a lot more such stories that actually uh, gave us hope and uh, strength like, to continue to uh, to like everybody is actually uh, even though like a lot of who lost the job or who lost home they still like looking for the opportunities to volunteer to like uh, to support the people somebody is making a presentation somebody is making uh, videos uh, even like some memes or something just to like embrace uh, ukrainians so we uh, didn't lost the hope okay. here's a continuation of this and yeah how like our map looks uh, now now you can see this red part it's, it's um territory ukrainian territories that uh, was deliberate liberate uh wait it's word liberate from Uk uh, russian forces and the uh, red part it is uh, what is controlled by russia now and uh, yeah you can see Mariupol and the like closest city here is my hometown. And now we have fights for all this front line. And actually some of the cities are not exist anymore for now. They just have a name. They just have name and just uh, like some, um, you know, you can just uh, guess that it was a city because uh, they, w uh, they was destroyed in like, as a whole. There is like some cities uh, that been occupied by Russia. Uh, so during after the um, Maidan in Ukraine, we demolished a lot of uh, Lenin monuments in Ukraine. There is like I don't know maybe a few somewhere left in small villages. 
uh, and when Russian came, they started to put back this Lenin's uh, in some cities. Uh, they even like returned some Soviet names to some cities that we like uh, renamed some city even like not even during the last eight years, uh, like uh, uh, longer before, but still uh, uh, there is like th they trying to like come back Ukraine to the Soviet Union and trying to like push us uh, push us to the same uh, path as uh, Russia is taking now. And uh, yes, then um, Macron, like president of uh, uh, France, uh, proposed to uh, like just uh, give this occupied territory to Russia like, and stop the war. And uh, <coughs> like here is some um, pictures uh, the how big this territory, especially compared to cant other countries. It's like uh, when you saw Ukrainian map, it's 20% of our territory, but it's how much is like uh, in some European country, how much if Russia would take this the same territory. Uh, how big this territory is, and actually, like European. Uh, so you can, um, uh, when the war ex actually began, so during the first days, we didn't get uh, a lot of support from EU because they expect that uh, there would be no fight. We would just like give uh, what Russia is wanting, and they actually tried to. Um, like push our government to give Russia whatever they want, so there would be no war, no conflict. It would be easier for everybody. I don't know for who, definitely not for Ukrainians to like not to fight, not to defend ourselves, not to fight for our independence, and just to give whatever Putin wants. But what Putin wants, nobody actually wants. So if in the beginning they told about the, the East and occupied only like they want uh, Donbass and Lugansk and so on. So when the full invasion began, they started to bomb the whole Ukraine and they want to take over the Kiev and like the whole Ukraine and closely after Kiev and after Ukraine probably would go to like uh, to the East Europe. I mean like Poland, Romania and other country who's actually now preparing a lot for like um for the any possibilities that can happen like uh, next even though like we are fighting as much as we can but uh, without like a lot of support from uh, abroad uh, I don't know what's going to be next uh, and you probably saw what's happening in Moldova Moldova is also preparing and they also have occupied Italia, the same as Georgia so um, there is like a lot of threat in, in in this country, and for example, I have a uh, friends in Georgia who is saying if uh, Russia is going to lose in Ukraine, so they will just come to the Georgia and occupy it, uh, Georgia because it would be easier for them. Georgia also don't have any military. Uh, it's imp it's impossible to like help them from military side because Russia is all around the Georgia and the sea side is like uh, taken by Russians, so it would be impossible to help like Ukraine now. So. Or we're going to stop Russia like now and for all, or Russia would just like, go somewhere else and take other independent countries too. Like for example, Russia now is basically control Belarus and uh, so many troops. Like you can see um, this map that we had before, like this green one part. So it uh, the Russian troops uh, went there here from Belarus territory, and a lot of uh, shootings, a lot of bombings now is uh, like. Uh, it's from Belarus territory, so Belarus allowed to transit of Russian troops. So Belarus allowed to like supply uh, to help the supply uh, the weapons uh, uh, there. And for example, my like city that I live now, Lviv, is usually bombed from the Belarus territory. So Belarus is uh, like uh, Russian alias and they so war crime. So and we when we will talk about who is guilty here, like not only Russia but Belarus too. And also, there is no like. Uh, but here you can see this uh, scale of the uh, damages that happen. Like people just don't have any place to live, like at all. 
And uh, when we will talk about also just give up and give uh, to Russia our territory, but uh, we should like know and remember every time that there is no any peace on occupied territory. Like people are tortured, people are oppressed. There is no law, like no human law. law. People even cannot satisfy their like basic needs. Like uh, in most cities, there is no gas, no electricity, like no hot water. You cannot even wash your hair, or, like hands. Like you just have no access to normal medicine. You have no access to education. So many like uh, uh, children who were on occupied territory, they cannot continue their education. And uh, here we can also see that now, uh, like we call it as a genocide, and it is a genocide of Ukraine uh, um, people. And uh, you can see how many like new graves we have, and it's only one example. But we have such new cemetery in uh, almost uh, every like big city, not a big city, and even um, cities that is closer to the uh, line of front. And uh, they just they just kill us just because we want to be Ukrainians, just because we we are not to be Russian. We want to have our own future. We want to have like possibility to make our own decision and to choose what uh, which way we want to develop. Uh, that's. Uh, I just wanted to show that uh, we, of course, uh, speak about a lot of uh, human losses, but um, there is another perspective. It's uh, it's my work. Uh, it's uh, environment, even though it's of course not priority now, but uh, from all uh, losses, damages that uh, are happening now from the environmental perspective, they are going to influence, like affect our life in the future. Uh, Ukraine is industrial country, we have like chemical, we have uh, plants, we have heavy metal, um, like around uh, 23,000 uh, like facilities industrial so and uh, 3,000 uh, 3, of them are uh, hazardous uh, and Russia is like constantly bombing some of these facilities so like some of this territory like you can see now what's happening and in which, uh, in which area it's more so in some of this uh, territory maybe uh, we would not be possible to leave. Probably there would. We don't have like at some territory even like a fresh uh, water. For example, it's uh, Donbas region, uh, the territory that been occupied. It, we don't have access from 2014. We don't know what's happening there. It's mining, uh, mining region. Uh, Russia, of course, didn't take care about mines, and uh, that's why it's happening some floods there. Uh, it means it polluted the groundwater. Uh, and what's interesting that it's affecting not only Ukrainians or Ukraine territory because like the groundwater like don't have a borders, uh, so it's also affecting the uh, Russian territory because it's close to them too. Uh, but uh, they don't care about that. Um, yeah, like I don't think that Russian government is caring about like their population too. So there is like just one point that uh, uh, it's what we are also communicating that uh, why we need to stop this war as, pos as soon as possible because uh, from environmental perspective, like Ukraine would be affected so much, uh, and I even don't know like about rebuild the houses. It would be like the easiest what we can do, but what we were going to do with all environmental damages, I even don't know. You can also choose uh, how we, how you ca uh, you call this war. It is Putin war, so it is Russian war. It's a big uh, question actually now about like how to call it Putin or Russian war because uh, there is a lot of discussion on this topic how to call it. Uh, who whose fault is uh, Putin's or Russians? How many like? Uh, there's like so many statements and so many positions about that. Um, and yeah, and we as Ukrainians are going to say <laughs> what is our perspective on that. Actually, uh, how to call uh, the war is also one of the Russian narratives, uh, narratives of Russia propaganda, how they use to use. So yeah, here's the results.
So mostly like half and half, totally half and half. We can return to this slide, I think, if we want to see results. So like uh, we as Ukrainians, we uh, um, like we call it as a, not a Putin's but Russian war because we are attacked by all Russia. Like we are attacked by Russians. It is not only Putin who uh, like came here to kill us. It's a lot of it's thousand and thousand Russian soldiers who kill us. It it is not like small Putin who kill, who came here, but it, it is people. And uh, we also see the huge huge support of uh, this uh, cruel actions so or these war crimes in uh, in Russia. Russia now. They support it, uh, like they support annexation of Crimea. They support a war in Donbass. And now they support uh, this, like as we ca they call it, the special military operation. And uh, even, of course, uh, like it's, it's um, like, it's good that uh, some people in Russia is protesting ag against uh, the war and um, we expect this, but uh, actually I was so, so naive before, so I expect a huge protest that, uh, that uh, like such a cruel uh, something happened there, and uh, like your like your friends can co kill other people. In fact, but like uh, we see how how many people use these new swastik, this new uh, swastika, this Z letters, how many people is proud to be Russians still like uh, complain and Russophobic and cannot understand what's happened, like really what's happened in the world. And uh, I believe that it's a responsible responsibility of this war, not only Putin, but it is uh, Russia, like it's all Russian as a representative of Russian political nation, like as a political nation who allowed this to happen. Uh, sil silence of this nation is allowed this to happen. Why Putin was uh, uh, like uh, in the government for so many years, so many decades, uh, why, why it's happened? Uh, we had a great example about Belarus. Uh, we, at some moment, we expect that Belarus is also going like uh, take a part in this war, and we also been like scared, like what's going to be if Russia would also support, like even though Belarus don't have like a huge army, but still it's like some support to Russia again. Uh, but it didn't happen because uh, like uh, the Lukashenko didn't have a uh, support from uh, the military. Uh, they didn't want to go to Ukraine. Uh, they didn't want to have this fight, this war. So that's why it's like Belarus still is not an active part uh, of this war. So yeah, they gave Putin a lens probably because like the military didn't decide that it's uh, Lukashenko decision who's like uh, even not recognized as a president by the population. And like 90%, 95% of Belarusians are against this war, even though like we see a huge, like it's not even like pull, okay, we know that some Russians are saying that all this, um, um, uh, questioners are like uh, uh, not true, and like people would not uh, would not say like the truth uh, in Russia because they're afraid and so on. But uh, there is like so many video, so many people who just like talk and some uh, uh, not YouTube, but there is like some apps uh, who just uh, you're connected to the Russian person. Uh, randomly and you're just speaking and people saying, yeah, like the war in Ukraine, yeah, that's great. We are going to fight all these ha holes and so on. Uh, so from this perspective, we see that actually the population is supporting a lot what's happening in Ukraine now. And we have a lot of Belarus volunteers now in Ukraine. So many people are fighting. And for example, some of the representatives from the Young Greens of Belarus are fighting now. They are in the Ukrainian army. and. Yeah, and uh, still, uh, Lukashenko is not uh, recognized as a, as a leader, a political leader, a leader of Belarus, but uh, Putin still is. And it's how to help Ukraine. Yeah, it's actually uh, the next presentation would also focusing on how to help. Like uh, I would also speak about embargo. 
uh, the 40% of uh, Russian state budget is coming from fossil fuels. So that's why we're like advocating, lobbying, whatever like uh, we call it. Uh, so the Russia will lose like a big part of the finance. Uh, like um, so to understand, like a 40% of the state budget it's uh, from the fossil fuel, and the third part of this budget is going to the military. Probably uh, during the war, it's even like higher. So you can understand, so from the fossil fuel, the money going is direct to, to there. Uh, so it's important to actually br uh, broke this uh, bloody line to finance this war and uh, like cut any uh, financial support to Russia through the fossil fuel or from, uh, from the business and so on. But uh, yeah, uh, because Russia is uh, fully depend on uh, fossil business uh, it's one of uh, the way how to stop and like actually uh, help not only to ukraine but also help to belarus to georgia and even to russia because maybe it's would give them a chance to stop this putin um, regime and maybe it's like will broke this propaganda line and give them a chance to actually change the country Also, one of uh, also ways it's a economic uh, and political isolation, because uh, while we s still speak this Putin and his uh, his representatives uh, in the government as a, like an equal, uh, they still uh, think that no punishment here. Like uh, while Russia still can use uh, any like benefits of uh, democratic society, there's will be, like uh, their population, Russian population will not understand what's happened and what is wrong. Like we like of course uh, like democratic countries cannot invade uh, the Russia like to liberate them as Russian did uh, say to that they did but they still like but um, democratic countries can can show in such way that something wrong and also to stop like to to make uh, this Putin regime not so powerful as it is now Also, it is very, very important for now is provide Ukraine these weapons, especially these heavy weapons, because of course Ukraine don't have uh, so much capacities to fight this such big army as Russia have now. So Russia prepared to this war so for so many years, but Ukraine not. Ukraine started to build our arm army from the very, very beginning, and uh, we need support and we need like modern weapons too, and we need uh, military equipment. We need uh, uh, humanitarian vegetarian stuff, like uh, even as t-shirts or some sweaters. And uh, we need um, cars, we need cars a lot. So like, but of course, like from the main part that we need weapons. Uh, from uh, until 2020, actually Russia received, like they bought from French, from German, a lot of military. So they had a contract. So even though Russia occupied uh, Crimea, they uh, like at attack Donbass, they still like uh, European, some European country continue to like have uh, this military trade. So it's actually give a chance to Russia be prepared for, the, for this war. And uh, that's why it's important for us like have enough military now to defend ourselves and fight them um, back again to Russia. Yeah, and we don't uh, like we don't want to invade Russia. We want we want just to protect our people and we want to protect our cities, our homes, our families. So we don't want to have uh, weapons to just to kill. We want to have uh, weapons for self defense. Like uh, and uh, like, we want to have uh, equal opportunities to like uh, to fight because Russia have a um, dominance there and Ukraine not. And then like someone said that, uh, uh, oh, you cannot send weapons because we want like we are so pacifist and we want to like we want to stop uh, killing. But you you just uh, uh, tolerate another killings. We just tolerate another torture that uh, then people cannot defend themselves. And uh, of course, for sure, you can help Ukrainian refugees who is abroad, who is in Ukraine still, because such a hell happening every day there. So even in uh, Western part of Ukraine, it's still not safe. 
every day. You in any moment, error rate uh, Syrians can like uh, um, like announce of that some rockets can like go targeted to something near your house, and you cannot be safe anywhere now in Ukraine. Uh, yesterday, to the Kiev flew a lot of, uh, not a lot, like some uh, missiles. For if I'm right, uh, they bombed uh, uh, industrial uh, area. But there is like uh, I saw just a post from my friend that uh, her house just like one kilometer from that area where, where the missile uh, bombed. Uh, and in Kiev, where is like no Russian soldiers still. Like they have a chance to actually attack from the Black Sea because they have like this uh, warship uh, with a lot of uh, missile who can like flew over like Ukraine and probably even longer. And actually, uh, this missile is uh, flew over the South uh, Ukrainian nuclear power plant station. So we have four of them in Ukraine. You probably know that Zaporizhia nuclear power plant station is occupied. It, uh, uh, Chernobyl zone has also been occupied, but after um, Russian left Kyiv region, they also left uh, Chernobyl. But they still occupied it, uh, Russian Zaporizhia. And PP, and uh, there's like a few situations that missile uh, flew over these uh, nuclear stations, and like uh, the whole world like watching like w what can happen like because if uh, if Zaporizhia is going to blow up, it's mean like second Chernobyl because it's the biggest nuclear power plant station in Europe. And uh, plus, it's like a Black Sea very close, so it's like uh, the whole region, like Turkey, Georgia, Romania, and other countries, Bulgaria, who had like a Black Sea uh, connection, so they also would be affected. And uh, also, the big part of the work that uh, do not require from you to be, for example, MP or something like this, you can also fight these uh, Russian propaganda narratives that we already like, discussed today a lot. And yeah, I hope the CDN will prepare some toolkit about uh, the, the list of uh, Russian propaganda narratives so you can use it. And. Uh, like, of course, you can donate. And we now, Ukrainians collect so many monies to, like, they raise so many monies to support Ukrainian army, to support refugees, to support just Ukraine. And uh, we're still, like, wondering <laughs> how many monies people <laughs> have because they donate, donate, and donate. But it, it's very inspiring, and we need it really a lot because. Like still, we have so many needs uh, that uh, which volunteers covers, and we have a uh, big uh, foundations can that uh, can help to the whole division, for example, of army, or we have uh, individuals which help for uh, like uh, also individual soldier. We have some foundation uh, which can help to all people from occupied territory. For example, I'm also. An, uh, like representative of one of such foundations, so which uh, help to people from my own hometown and to, to help people from hometown on who is on occupied territory and who is now as a refugee and who is now in the army, but also Berdyansk origin. So you can also ask me. I will send uh, some uh, bank accounts too. So it's a small <laughs> promo, small announcement, so you can help even in such way. And yeah, it's here the meme from Lithuania because recently they raised uh, five uh, million euros to buy a military drone, like uh, by Qatar, and uh, then Turkey agreed to give it for free, and they decided to for this amount of money to buy uh, weapons, like to equip this drone. So like even people abroad can like uh, raise so many monies, and we're very very grateful for people who support us abroad. It's very important to know that we are not alone. Yeah, if you like, I think on this moment we can finish our presentation. But if you have so many questions, you can ask. Like you can ask now. You can ask uh, like approach us individually too, like me, Zhenya, another Zhenya. <laughs> uh, who can give a, a microphone?
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll have a very quick question. Well, first, thank you for your presentation, and I would like to express my full support to you personally and to the people of Ukraine. And as for my question, so um, I was wondering, like, even now, uh, in the midst of uh, like uh, uh, military, you know, invasion, if there are any political parties inside the parliament or outside the parliament in Ukraine who, um, you know, are Russia-supported and are trying to still justify Russian military aggression. Because, for example, in Georgia, we have some, like, you know, political parties, like, mostly far-right groups who are trying to bring up some, you know, nonsense arguments to, to, like, try to justify what Russia is doing. And I was wondering if that's the case also in Ukraine and how, like, they are trying to justify it. Okay, we had uh, such a party, uh, a pro-Russian party, one of the five uh, of uh, our parliament. Uh, they called uh, themselves, it's very like funny, for life, but now just so they're forced, they support just kill people. And uh, But now their like, activities is banned in uh, Ukraine, but still they have an individual, these uh, deputies, but they like, uh, like trying to be very cool quiet they no, do not call it okay there is no war or something like this just they um, they just continue somehow to also use these Russian narratives and uh, also for example to be kind of spy or something like this but there is not a lot and of course like if you will openly support Russia you will be detained for sure thank you Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the for the very inter interesting presentation um, and all the, the narrative that you had built on looking back in history, background from the 20th century and even further, and then at the present times and how those are related. Uh, really build on your argument that how the war is not only a, a Putin's war but it's a Russian war. And going on with the same flow of thought that you present during your your speech talks, um, my my question and I would be interested to know your opinion is. Yes, now you present the past, you present the present, how the past influenced the present war. And my question to you is how the future will be. I mean, and I mean after the war. Maybe Ukraine will fully win the war, will partially win the war. But then how do you see the, the thing developing? Because you can win the war, or partially win the war, but you, Russia will keep staying there. And that past that you showed us, how these, uh, uh, their perceptions on Ukrainians was and how their relationship and, 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 and uh, behavior against Ukrainians was. We know how the present is, but how can you solve this in the future? I mean, what, what would be your... I mean, yeah, it's, it's a very big, broad question, but looking at it from now, how do you say the next, uh, the next thing that will go on will to, to, to have a more peaceful relationship should be and how, if it can be actually like that? <laughs> Yeah, I don't believe that uh, with Russia we can have any peaceful relationship in, I don't know, 100 years until, I don't know, probably these children who've been born will forget and like another generation would be born. Um, maybe, but I would try to actually keep this memory to, to everybody so we would not have uh, the same mistake as we like did like 30 years ago so we just forget and we've been like... I would say, like, unprepared for, for this war, for the uh, war, like, in 2014. And I would say that we, um, like, we could do more uh, during the last eight years to be, like, better prepared. And I think, like, uh, after the war will stop, like, hopefully we will win. So we will, like, prepare for any uh, possibilities to prevent like Russia to come again so it would depends again uh, how it will end um, but like Russia still will be there so I would like I don't know below the high fence or I don't know deep uh, graves so any tanks or anything like can pass and come to our territory and try to take again uh, like um, our independence and our rights to to make a decisions and still, I believe that, like, we, we need to fight this Russian imperialism too. Like, Ukraine now is fighting this Russia and this Russian imperialism, but also uh, not only Ukraine suffer here. Like, Belarus people who are like in 
prison that is by Putin's regime. It's uh, Georgia, who is like very suffering from Russian uh, pro-Russian politics, and uh, it's top on the uh, the way of uh, European democratic values development. Moldova, who still like suffered, and so many countries as affected by Russian influence. And I believe then the like uh, the war uh, finished and. Like, I don't know in which condition will be Russia. Maybe where will be no Russia anymore in such a like, uh, uh, form as we have it now. Because Russia is also it's like, uh, named as a uh, prison of uh, nations. Uh, so many uh, different folks are now assimilated is by Russian, but they still have their own culture, their own culture, um, future, I, I, I hope. But, and, uh, yeah, but I believe that uh, Ukrainians could not uh, have any now like peace building uh, activities with Russians. Why Russians uh, still like think like that? They are like a regional cult. Like you cannot just uh, persuade a person who believe uh, in some religion like. Uh, Staff uh, just do not believe it. You you need to work and work and work so many so many years and uh, so many like um, okay. You you should you should do a lot like to to make Russian to forget about the imperialism uh, narratives. If you don't have a question, I think we can finish our presentation because we're already late. <laughs> Thank you for listening.